Good evening, TBC and Guest Church. It's good to be in the house of the Lead me, guide me along the way. Lord, 
if you need me. I don't think you need all of us. We will pass it. We want to express the blessing on the musician tonight. Just them and they play their instruments. Father God, we thank you for all that you're doing.
when you're hearing tonight, on September 1, because I promise I will tell you what happened after 1996, on tonight. On September 1, 1996, Reverend Leroy A. Cherry entered the hall.
we give thanks to you, Father. Thank you for allowing us to give back a small portion of what you have blessed us with. Father, we thank you for those that gave, those that wanted to give but didn't have to give. Father, we thank you for being our source, our Jehovah John. And we thank you for giving us the ability to give well. So, Father, we ask that these times are not to be used for your, to edify your church and your kingdom, Heavenly Father. To God be the glory for this in Jesus Christ our Lord, we do pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. Yeah. 
know uh, how far you all have traveled to be here tonight. That's the bullet. I flew in from Tampa, Florida. Just to be with y'all. There's no place I'd rather be to than standing in this state for revival. How many showed up for revival tonight?
verse 28. I'll be reading verses 28 through 30 in your hearing from the King James Version, though I will parallel the New American Standard Bible by the way of my presentation. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 28. Third night will come from the third chapter, and I'll only give you three verses. If you found it, say amen. If you have not found it, just simply ask me to wait. All right. If I wait too long, I'm going to simply ask you to catch up. <laughs> Daniel chapter 3, beginning at, verse 30, uh, beginning at verse 28. We find these words inscribed, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their pieties that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dungeon, because there is no other God that can deliver after this soul. Verse 30 concludes by reading, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. You may be seated in the presence of God. My brothers and sisters, on this third installment of Revival, on this Thursday night, I want to share with you from this thought, this subject, I want to talk to you from this topic. Life being lessons for living. Life being lessons for living. Oftentimes, we mirror words that are shared as a promotional piece or a motivating piece saying we're living our best lives. The truth of the matter is, is that if there is no life that is attached to the Lord, you're really not experiencing your best life. All right. All right. Now we have this thing suggesting that life, watch this, is not just living, but life is lifing, and that we experience lifing when we live. So since our focus is on lifing, let me suggest to you tonight, we're going to talk about lifing lessons to live by. We as believers and those of us that are gathered here tonight have all had encounters with trouble and trials. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that in this life we will have tribulations. And if I took a poll tonight and I asked a simple question, how many of us have ever been through anything? I probably would get a similar response. But can I follow up that question? How many of us know that God brought you through? Okay, so if I know that I'm going to do something, but I'm certain that God will bring me through it, the next time I face it, it won't be so bad. And I will have a better ability of lifing and existing in this life. Here are some lessons the Bible will present to us tonight as we encounter this thing called life. How do we make it, preacher? How do we move forward in the time in which we live? Well, if you know anything about the book of Daniel, a very interesting prophetic book, Daniel listed as one of the prophets. If you know anything about the 12 chapters that make up the book of Daniel, there are a few interesting things that come to mind. Daniel, in case you didn't know it, according to the book of Daniel, is really the goat, y'all. Daniel's the goat because, why well, says, not only is the book named after the author and the writer, prophet Daniel, but in the book of Daniel, 11 of the 12 chapters all focus on Daniel. But I'm not in that chapter tonight. I'm in chapter 3. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me chapter 3 says nothing about you? Don't even see Daniel's name written in chapter 3. And I wondered if Daniel is the goat of the book of Daniel, why is it that Daniel is in every chapter, chapter? 
chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, on and throughout to chapter 12. Why then, preacher, is Daniel's name not mentioned in chapter 3? Well, upon further examination, I will discover in my reading, but also in the revelation from God, that there is a specific reason why Daniel's name is not mentioned in chapter 3. Y'all walk with me if you will. The reason Daniel's name is not mentioned in chapter 3 is because chapter 3 wasn't about Daniel. Chapter 3 was about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now that's good news for somebody tonight. Watch it. Every chapter don't have to be about you. You don't have to be the goal. You don't have to be the one that's always focused. Just as long as you in the book. Just as long as God takes time to focus on you. And somebody here early evening shout right there. That even if I got limited time, even if I got just a little wind, even if I'm just in the corner, the good news is he ain't forgotten about me. Is there anybody in the house tonight that's thankful that you're in the eyes of God? Daniel's name is not even mentioned in chapter 3. Why? Because Daniel chapter 3 wasn't about Daniel. It was about three Hebrew boys that decided that they was going to life and they were going to live their best life. Tonight, as I shared, a life ain't lessons for us to live by. Well, here are a few things that we can take from the text tonight. Well, if you're familiar with chapter 3, y'all might know it goes something like this. Sister Hill, the Bible says in the very first verse of chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar decides to make an image of gold. I said gold, y'all. I didn't say an image of God. It was an image of gold. That's in verse 1. But before we would conclude verse 30, it moves from an image of God to some individuals in a group that will change you what happened in verse 1 just because they stood tall in chapter 3. Walk with me if you will. The Bible says that he makes this image of gold. He gets the audacity to think he's bigger than who he is. I know he was the king, but he nothing compared to the king of kings. And can I say that? Well, I know he's the king during the days of Daniel, but he's no match for the king of kings. And the Bible says that he had the audacity to create this image of gold and he put across the country a decree that at a certain moment, everybody, and I do mean everybody, scripture said that the princes and the governors and the captains and the judges and the treasurers all had to bow down. I did say everybody. And the preachers, and the deacons, and the trustees, and the ushers, and the choir members. Everybody had to bow down. Well, if you know the story and how it progresses, word spread. And that was a group of individuals. I call them the Tattletale Chaldeans. It's in the book, y'all. Y'all know every church got some tattletale. Church. This is another church in the bird that's got a whole bunch of tattletales that go and tell stuff. Ain't even none of their business and they tell it. Got half the story and they tell it. Don't even have it right and they tell it. Just want to be heard and they tell it. And the Bible says that the Chaldean tattletales went and told the king and said, Man, listen, there's a group of three individuals as a that I 
heard the king put out. Uh, the three boys said, listen, uh, he said, you heard right, because uh, they ain't who we about. Uh, now you gave us a job, but you ain't our Jesus. Uh, you gave us a government job, but you ain't our God. Uh, and the Bible says uh, that the king says, okay, uh, since you three boys so bad, uh, I don't understand why you wouldn't, uh, but if you choose not to, uh, what God of yours uh, is going to deliver you and what I'm about to put you through. Uh, the boys step back. Uh, these were some brilliant young men. Uh, and they said, listen, uh, it is not for us to tell you uh, what he will do, uh, but we're sure enough convinced uh, that he will do it if he wants to. Uh, and that anybody in the house tonight uh, that knows he serve a God, uh, they can do whatever. He wants to do. Y'all go and sit down. Y'all making me happy up in here. And so when you get to the text, the Bible tells us that they said, listen, we, we're careful not to answer you as such. He said, but we want you to know that you can throw us into a fiery furnace. Now, in those days of biblical times, the threat against enemies was that they would be thrown in a furnace and they would be exhumed. Watch this. And destroyed. And see, that put fear in the minds of those in the land because nobody wanted to get burned up. I find that rather interesting, Reverend Bullock, that nobody wants to get burned up in those days, but the way folk acted now, it seems like everybody wants to get burned up. That they said, listen, I ain't afraid of your threat. Listen, if you put us in there and the God we serve decides to let us burn, so be it. We still ain't going to bow down. But just know, if he wants to get us out, he'll get us out. Is anybody in the house tonight know we serve a God that can do anything but fail? There's never been a situation that he There's a few things that we can learn. These are life lessons for living by. So the Bible says that he, watch this, he throws them in the furnace. And when he throws them in the furnace, the record is there's another individual that is identified. And there's some discussion about who it is. Now, Nebuchadnezzar would come out of his mouth. Why is it that I see a fourth in the fire? And he looks like the son of man. Okay, maybe y'all missed that. And I was wondering, how is it that King Nebuchadnezzar knew what the Lord looked like when he was making golden images of somebody that didn't know? Thank <laughs> you. 
Bible says around about verse 28, it says, Then, somebody say, Then. Didn't look good at the beginning, but the text says, Then. How many of y'all know that God can turn things around? And if God turns things around, uh, he'll put a thin in your life. Uh, I wasn't who I was supposed to be then the Lord changed me. Uh, I wasn't where I was supposed to be then the Lord took me. Uh, is there anybody grateful uh, that he puts a thin in your life? Uh, the Bible tells us here in verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar spake. Mm. If I'm talking in y'all, he been saying a whole lot, but he ain't been saying much. He didn't put out a whole lot of threats. He's already put out a decree, but what he's been saying ain't meant to be a human being. But now he's got something to say. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three names are familiar to many of us. But tonight I read three verses. Those three names are in all three verses. And the reason those three names are in all three verses is because these three boys can teach us some lessons about life. Help me, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Help third Baptist tonight. And they said, okay, just check out what it happened. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now the king is acknowledging the supremacy of their God. The king is suggesting that there's something special about their God. Now he ain't called it his God yet, but he says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I'm interested in why he would say that. He says, who have sent his angel. Told y'all to give y'all some life and lessons to live by. Here's the first life and lesson. First of all, we see their unwavering position. They did not waver. That's why they found themselves in the position they were in. Some of us can be encouraged as a life lesson, can I suggest to you, because we need to understand no matter what, we need to stand. Just because it's popular don't mean it's in our purpose. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean we should be doing it. Huh? Just because everybody over here huh, is engaged in it doesn't mean we ought to be engaged in it. He expects us to stand up for what's right huh, and let wrong know you're wrong. Huh? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, huh, I'm standing on right. Huh? We see their unwavering once this position because they did not this is why King Nebuchadnezzar was blessing their God. He wasn't blessing their God just because of what he had done for them, but he was blessing their God because of the effect, the, the faithfulness and allegiance of these three. Watch the text. The Bible says, Did Nebuchadnezzar speak and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have sent his angel. Not only did we see their unwavering position, but secondly, we see God's ultimate presence. He, he, here's some life lessons that, that we got to be able to acknowledge God's ultimate presence. I didn't just say presence, y'all. I said ultimate presence. Okay, you might be wondering. See, ultimate uh, simply suggests uh, that it means the best achievable or imaginable of its kind. It was God's best achievable and it was the best that we could imagine that could have happened in their life. Okay, I thought y'all knew the story. They were thrown in a furnace. And while they were thrown in a furnace, it was because of their unwavering position. They wouldn't bow down, so watch this, it put them in the furnace. But Nebuchadnezzar said, an angel of the Lord. It's interesting that few verses prior to that, he acknowledged that he looked in and saw that it was the form of the image of the Son of Man. Son of Man, well, watch this. He didn't say it was, 
He just said it had the image of. Right. Okay, somebody just missed that. Right. There are some things that have happened in your life, not just because God was there, but simply because the image of God was over your life. So looked at you and saw something special about you. And it did not have to be the presence of God, but it didn't have to be the image of God, but it simply identified his presence. And that's why when they look at you and they scratch their head, they say there's something special about them. There's something in them. There's something over them. There's something on them. And is there anybody grateful for the presence of God? But I did say that this was ultimate. What do you mean, Big Jerry? Ultimate. This wasn't just that he was there, it was ultimate. And the reason it was ultimate is because when he showed up, Nebuchadnezzar said, An angel of the Lord. Y'all understand when the Lord shows up, he changes situations. Here it is, watch this. We suggest, according to text, that he shows up. Nebuchadnezzar says, this time, it was an angel. Watch this. You have sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. I told you, we see their unwavering position now because they trusted in the Lord. Even though it put them in the fiery furnace, Scripture tells us that we get to see the ultimate presence of God. It's ultimate because of this. They're in a fiery furnace. Everybody before them has been burned up. They turn it up seven times hotter. They still didn't burn up. If you know the story, the people that turn the knob and turn it up seven times hotter, they burned up. Be careful putting your hands against somebody that chosen by God. That's another sermon, but the Bible tells us what's this, of that he identifies the ultimate presence because whoever showed up, it, it made sure that they walked out like they had never went in. Is there anybody in the house that's walked out of a situation that was so bad, but you walked out? As if you had never went in, and you look so good, you didn't even know what you had to go through. And the Bible says here, we see their unwavering position, life in lessons to live by. We see God's ultimate presence. Let me tell you something, Minister Jamie, how this was an ultimate presence. He shows up, they see an image. First is the image of the Son of Man. Then he says that he had sent an angel, but he knew that the presence of God was there. Now this is what really gets me, it's the ultimate presence. How many of y'all know that God can be everywhere all the time? Theologians call it the omnipresence of God. The great grandmama would say that everywhere is of God. But I know a little boy that could probably explain it a little better than that. There was a little boy, the pastor was in his study. The little boy was running out of office. And the little boy kept running. The pastor grabbed the little boy and said, hey son, you can't run in church. I'm in there trying to study and prepare for revival at Third Baptist. And he said, listen, stop running. The little boy said, okay, Rev. About two minutes later, he comes Running by him. The preacher went out and said, Listen, son, no running in the church. I don't want to tell you anymore. He said, Okay, Pastor, I'll be obedient. Two minutes later, he come running by him. So the pastor said, Listen, I'm going to have to think of this. I'm going to have to use some psychology on him to get this boy to sit down. So he said, Son, come on in here. He said, I want you to sit in that chair. He said, I'm going to catch him now. I'm stopping from running. I'm going to give him a problem. He got to think. All day long. And so he said, son, he said, I tell you what. He said, listen, he said, while you're sitting in that chair, you see this apple on the corner of my desk? The boy said, yes, pastor. He said, I tell you what, I'll give you this apple if you can tell me where God is. The boy said, I'll give you this chair. He said, Ray, I tell you what, I'll give you a whole bushel of apples. If you can tell me what God ain't. Okay, I'm just simply here to ask somebody. We thank God for his omnipresence. How many know he's everywhere? All the time. Anybody thankful 
situation. And I can live better if I understand about God's unparalleled power. But in the text, before I close the book, Pastor Dotson, it says in verse 30, here comes that word again. Then tell your neighbor, here's another thing. Oh, my God. 
but he blessed me anyhow. I should have got that job, but he blessed me anyhow. I should be a girl I am, but he blessed me anyhow. I should be in a position of me, but he keeps on blessing me. Somebody ought to say, yeah! A miracle.
because I know that they welcome you with open arms. That's my second appeal. Here's my third appeal. Listen carefully. If you're here tonight and you've been struggling with life, say it again. You've been struggling with life. That means life has hit you hard. And you're trying to deal with it. You're trying to manage it. Yeah, you may encouraged from time to time, but tonight you're struggling. Tonight you're fighting. Tonight you're struggling with it. You're dealing with it. I invite you to come to And we'll pray for you. We'll pray that you can apply these life and blessings. Come, whosoever wins. Broken, come. Beaten, come.
But when we leave for the altar, I examine the scripture. And I say, I want to hear their testimony. I want to hear what they have to say. We know what they said before they went in. But nothing's recorded about them testifying after they came out. Chapter 4 goes right back to Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had some dreams. Daniel comes back and starts interpreting dreams. But I can imagine what their testimony was. Yeah. And we trust that he'll have you grow us out. So before you leave this one, I simply want you to say, I trust him when he brings me out. Put your hands together, let's have a dollar this year. Valeria Randall. 